anatomy and physiology. They are doctorees for what it is and how it works. The human voice is extraordinary and complex. In a moment, it can convey the terror of a scream or the beauty of a song. Since it's as old as humankind, you would think that we had figured the voice out centuries ago, but not so. Not only have we begun to understand the voice only quite recently, but we are still learning new materials about the voice, including anatomy and physiology, all the time. And much of that material is what you will hear in the presentations during this symposium. Almost all of the symposium is new scientific information from one field or another. There are some workshops, there are these tutorials, but for the most part, it's new information. The anatomy of the voice does not extend from just the hyoid bone or tongue bone to the suprasternal notch at the top of your breastbone. Virtually all body systems are involved. Singers know this. Speech language pathologists know it. Laryngologists, otolaryngologists, don't really learn that very well in training, much more now than 20 years ago. But still, doctors think about the larynx when they think about the voice, and there is much more to it. You can see that when you look at a singer, that by the way is Springsteen for anybody in the room who's old enough or young enough to not know. The larynx receives the greatest attention because it's what we get to operate on and what many of you think about. But it is only one component of the voice system, yet an important one. However, it's not even needed to be able to phony. Laryngectomy patients who've lost the larynx to cancer speak perfectly intelligibly, yet it is needed to be able to phony normally or super normally if you are a professional singer or speaker. For convenience, the larynx can be divided into a skeleton, mucosa, intrinsic muscles, and extrinsic muscles. Whether you are in a doctor's office or a speech pathology office or a singing studio, it helps to be able to articulate the components of the instruments with which we are working so that we can analyze what's working and what's not working and the process for that is the same in the singing studio as it is in the doctor's office. I, I still teach singing, so I can tell you that with, with certainty. The more you can articulate your analysis and not just do it by the gestalt, the more efficient you are as a teacher and of course as a physician and practitioner. The laryngeal skeleton consists of the thyroid, cricoid, and peritoritinoid cartilages and some other structures that are of less importance to us at the moment. The larynx sits in the neck. This is the hyoid bone, which attaches to the tongue and the larynx. So all that stuff about using your tongue affecting your larynx is real. There is a scientific basis for it, not just in the resonance system, but here as well. The thyroid cartilage, which like almost everything else in the airway, is horseshoe shaped and open in the back. The cricoid cartilage, the only circumferentially intact structure in the airway, and perched atop the cricoid cartilage are the peritoritinoid cartilages. Note the cartilage sits in the body in front of the spinal column, buffered by a little bit of soft tissue in the pharynx. When we are born, the laryngeal complex is high around C2, C3. By the time we mature, it drops to around C6 or C7. That lengthening of the vocal tract is part of what we perceive as voice maturation and aging. When we are born, the laryngeal cartilages are cartilage. As we age, they ossify, starting in the late teens and early 20s, and 
The larynx is fairly much ossified, turned largely to bone, by the time we are in our 60s. So, if you're playing basketball or hockey or on stage next to a soprano who does this at the end of her song and karate chops the tenor in the neck, if you are a child, this complex is compressible. It gets pushed back against the bony spinal column and for the most part bounces back. It may hemorrhage. But as we get older and more brittle, it fractures. For the, are there any laryngologists, surgeons in the room? Okay. Another implication <coughs> of that information is surgical. There are procedures described for changing pitch, particularly in transgender page, patients. One of them is cricothyroid approximation, which was described when thyroplasty was originally described. Another is cricothyroid subluxation, which was a procedure that I introduced that holds up longer in which the cricoid cartilage is tucked underneath the thyroid cartilage and they're sewn together. So when you get a soprano voice, it stays that way. If you're operating on a 30-year-old, that's a wonderful operation if I say so myself. If you try to do it on a 60-year-old, it's really hard and it's not a good choice. Furthermore, the center of the cricoid cartilage doesn't ossify as much. So if you are trying a maneuver to lift the cricoid and put a hook under the center, you're likely to fracture. If you put hooks toward the sides of the cricoid, off the midline, you can approximate the cricoid and thyroid and it is not likely to fracture. This is anterior, which means front, posterior, which means back. This prominence is the Adam's apple, or thyroid prominence. This is the cricoid in adult males. The Adam's apple is the most prominent protrusion in this anatomy. In children and in females, the cricoid cartilage is most prominent. If you palpate your own necks, you can confirm that. This is the larynx split down the middle. So that's thyroid cartilage. You remember it's horseshoe, so there's no thyroid cartilage in the back. Cricoid, front and back. And suspended near the midpoint of the thyroid cartilage coming from the vocal processes of the arytenoid to the inside of the thyroid cartilage is this white structure which is mislabeled vocal cord. We stop using, but please remember it because we're going to use it as a reference point. We stopped using the word vocal cord decades ago in favor of vocal folds. The German term vocal lips is probably more descriptive and accurate, but we use vocal folds. However, this is neither the vocal cord nor the vocal fold. Stay tuned, you will find out what it is before we're done. Thyroid, cricoid, arytenoid, hyoid. This is anterior, this is posterior, so you're looking at the right side of the body. The cartilages are attached by complex joints. They are synovial joints, just like elbows and knees, subject to the same afflictions. Infection, trauma with dislocation. Moreover, they are not screw-like joints. They're of complex shape and they have pliability, and that's of considerable importance in a lot of ways. First, because of the way they work. And second, because we're not good enough to reconstruct them when they're badly injured. This is the larynx from the front. This is the Adam's apple or thyroid prominence, cricoid, hyoid bone. If you can remember thyroid, cricoid, and arytenoid, you know most of the anatomy for the multiple choice test. <coughs> Anatomists are generally not terribly imaginative. So there's the thyroid, there's the cricoid, that's the cricothyroid membrane, this is the thyrohyoid membrane. So imagine in your mind's eye where the vocal folds and the arytenoids are. Use your x-ray vision. You should be able to look at a patient or a student and know the anatomy of the instrument. Any violinist can do that. 
unfortunately, not every singer. So as we remove the thyrohyoid membrane, you can see inside this leaf-shaped epiglottis attached on the inside of the thyroid cartilage, which covers your airway so that you don't end up with polychelae in your lungs uh, when you're finishing dinner. This is an image with the cricothyroid membrane removed. This space is artificially widened. And as you look inside, you see the signet ring-shaped cricoid cartilage and perched atop it, the pyramidal-shaped arytenoid cartilages. Please note that the arytenoids are sitting on a curved surface on the cricoid cartilage, which influences substantially how they function. The arytenoid cartilages also have a vocal process to which the vocal folds attach a muscular process to which the muscles attach, and an apex on each thyroid cartilage, on each arytenoid cartilage. For the physicians in the audience, I, I won't go over this, but there are good data in the literature on the size of the airway. So when you are arguing with your anesthesiologists about whether they should be using a five and a half or six tube, rather than letting them put in an eight or nine tube, there are data, and the outside diameters of the tubes are readily available on the packages. This is an anesthesiologist's eye view from the head of the table, front, back, right, left, hyoid bone, epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, arytenoid cartilages, and those white structures that were mislabeled vocal cords. They emanate from the vocal processes, attached inside the thyroid cartilage. And I'm sure that all of you remember that the vocal process is of different embryologic origin from the rest of the arytenoid, from the arytenoid body. So there is an embryologic fusion plane right here where the vocal process meets the body. That is why in the operating room, we never put an instrument underneath the vocal process and lift that will cause a, a tear. We have other ways of reducing anteriorly dislocated arytenoids. It used to be said that the arytenoids rocked, glide, and rotated. Actually, they revolve in a, in a matter that is more complex than that. Now, I mentioned to you that they are sitting on a curved surface. These are CT scans from a human. There is the synovial joint we discussed, which looks just like a little baby temporomandibular joint, if you look at it on an x-ray. Here is the position of the arytenoids during phonation, when you're saying something. Here is the position of the arytenoids in the same person when you take a breath. So you remember I told you that sitting on that curved structure had a huge impact on how things work. And you can see that the arytenoids don't simply move apart to let the air in. They move laterally and they slide down the cricoid. This is very complex positioning and repositioning. We've done a fair bit of work on arytenoid dislocation from trauma, and I can tell you we can get voices back, but we almost never get normal function of the cricoarytenoid joint back once it's been disturbed. Charlie, would you be good enough to play the one on the left, please? This is another CT scan. Ah, my error. Encore, Charlie. These are the arytenoids. This is the cricoid. This is courtesy of Jean Abedbal and Albert Castro in Paris who make these elegant displays. Notice how little contact there is between the arytenoid and the cricoid. Charlie, please play the one on the left. On, on the screen's right. This is the same thing. There's hardly any contact at all 
So it's actually fairly amazing with all the intubations that happen that these don't get dislocated far more often than they do. Although they do get dislocated far more often than the dislocation is recognized. The intrinsic muscles, the muscles inside the larynx, are responsible for changes in position, abduction, which means pulling apart, adduction, which means coming together. You can think of it, if you, if you don't remember the terms, you can think of an ad as coming together, and longitudinal tension. Most of those muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The superior larynx for, for your multiple choice test. <clears throat> if you can remember that the superior laryngeal nerve innervates the cricothyroid muscle, then you've got all the rest. Everything else is recurrent laryngeal nerve. None of what I just said is strictly true. Those are the basic gross connections, but there are interconnections with crossover of recurrent and superior nerves and other crossovers that didn't used to be recognized and the importance of which is still not fully understood. Now the cricothyroid muscle, which we just discussed, stretches the vocal folds. It's responsible for longitudinal tension, that is projection and pitch change. The posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, or PCA, is responsible for abduction. That's the muscle you use to breathe. When you go, the PCA pulls your vocal folds apart and lets the air, the cricothyroid muscle stretches them when you go to a higher note. Everything else brings your vocal folds together. You're all still awake out there? <laughs> so far, so good. That protects your airway and it lets you speak and sing. So mostly we are working with adults. The primary adductors are the thyroarytenoid, lateral cricoarytenoid, and interarytenoid muscles, and the cricothyroid, depending on where the vocal folds start, can be. So the PCA, again, anatomist's lack of imagination, posterior cricoarytenoid muscle starts from the posterior aspect of the cricoid and inserts into the muscular process of the arytenoid, and when that muscle fires, it shortens as, as muscles do and it pulls the vocal fold out and the tip of the vocal fold up. What does that mean from a practical standpoint? That means these muscles don't just open and close the vocal folds, they alter the shape of the vibratory margin of the vocal fold. They all have nerves that do this. I mentioned this for the, the students and residents in the room. The innervation of the thyroarytenoid muscle and some of these other muscles was first published in the 21st century. When I was writing the third edition of my professional voice book, I spent six months redoing the anatomy chapter and I had done some surgery where I was looking for the thyroarytenoid nerve and had trouble finding it. So I went to find out its variations, unpublished. We did those dissections and published it with one of my residents for the first time in the early 2000s. So the lesson there is science and facts that you would automatically assume have been known since the time of Retzius are not necessarily known. There's a lot of even basic gross anatomy research left to do in this system, and it's of great practical value, especially to the surgeon. So when those muscles fire and cause the PCA to abduct the vocal folds, I told you that it lifts and sharpens and stretches the vocal fold. How about other muscles? Take the vocalis muscle, or medial belly of the thyroid. That is parallel to that structure mislabeled vocal cord. When you fire that, what moves? Nothing. It's isometric. So the vocal fold edge bulks up. That's the body of the vocal fold and provides lateral resistance. So when the other vocal fold hits it, it doesn't 
get knocked out of the way and flutter. That's why, for example, when we treat people for spasmodic dysphonia, a dysphonia that makes you sound like this with botulinum toxin, we restore fluency, but we never restore normalcy. If those people are singers, when they try to sing loudly, their voices will flutter because of the loss of lateral resistance. We try to manage that by, by using ultra low doses and frequent injections, but it's never quite right because of that lateral resistance function. And each of the muscles affects the shape. The thyroid muscle, mid the medial belly of which is called the vocalis muscle, I just told you about. The lateral cranioarytenoid muscle brings the vocal process to the midline. The interarytenoid muscle, which I'll show you in a moment, closes the posterior glottic gap. They are supposed to work in concert. Again, how many laryngologists in the room? How many of you have seen recurrent granulomas? <clears throat> Where you have an inflammatory granuloma on the vocal fold? <clears throat> You excise it, and it comes back. I think we all have. If you do frame-by-frame -frame analysis, high speed is best, but you can usually tell with the strobe. One of the common reasons for that is a lateral cricloarytenoid dominant closure pattern. So instead of having the LCA and the inner arytenoid creating broad closure, the LCA snaps the vocal processes together at the tip and makes forceful contact, which causes trauma, which causes the granuloma. Very hard for speech language pathologists to get people to break that muscular control pattern. However, if you inject botulinum toxin into the lateral cricloarytenoid muscle, they can't do that anymore, and then speech language pathologists can work with them so they maintain the pattern. So far, I've never had to inject anybody twice. The, the voice therapy does the rest. Now, the first person who thought of this <clears throat> injected the vocalis muscle, because that's what everybody did for spasmodic dysphonia, and they weren't really thinking analytically. If you inject the LCA, you do the job better and don't interfere with the voice nearly so much, unless the Botox spreads to the vocalis. See, anatomy is actually practical. <laughs> the interarytenoid muscle is the only one that has substantial bilateral innervation, and it's responsible for medial compression. If any of you has not seen the old Venard 16 millimeter movie on how the voice works, you, you should get a hold of a copy and take a look at it, and you'll understand this immediately. The cricothyroid muscle brings the cricoid and thyroid closer together. In the process, the cricoid rocks back on the cricothyroid joint, and the vocal process gets further and further away from the thyroid cartilage, so the vocal fold stretches, and pitch goes up. If the cricothyroid joints are injured, that doesn't work so well. If there is superior laryngeal nerve paralysis, it doesn't work so well. Cricothyroid joint injury is much more common than recognized. When I recognized my first case sometime in the 1980s and published it and went to the literature, there was one case that had been published in 1963, I think in Germany. But if you think about it, when you get elbow injuries, they are right to the side of the larynx over the cricothyroid joint. And people get joint stiffness, scar, fibrosis. And there is a tilt, and that focal fold doesn't stretch right. And people take a look and say, oh, superior laryngeal nerve paralysis, when it's actually mechanical. And that's proven easily enough with laryngeal electromyography. The extrinsic muscles are the strap muscles in the neck, the, the muscles that stand out on your average mediocre held in tenor. Thank 
you. Somebody is still awake. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. <clears throat> they move the laryngeal complex up and down, among other things. Now, you remember I told you that the joints are pliable. They move in multiple directions. So as you pull the larynx apart or squish it together, which happens when you change vertical position, you also change the angles and distances between the cartilages and hence the, the lengths and conditions of the focal folds. That is one of the reasons why trained classical singers maintain the larynx at a fairly constant level, regardless of pitch. Untrained singers will have the larynx go up when they go to high notes, and down when they go to low notes, but operatic singers don't generally do that so much. One reason is to maintain the length of the resonance system, but another is so that the vocal folds are kept in a fairly constant position and tension and can make fine adjustments that are not audible. When the larynx pops up, you can hear differences. The strap muscles are responsible for that, and even a little abnormality of the strap muscles can affect voices, especially professional voices, disproportionately. For example, that's the thyroid gland. I won't ask for a show of hands, but for sure some of the people in this room have had thyroid surgery, and even more for sure some of you will at some time during your life. If the thyroid surgeon retracts these muscles, to get at the thyroid gland, even if it's a big thyroid gland, and keeps them intact, your chances of having a good voice result are better if you're an elite singer than they are if these muscles are cut, even if they're sewn back together. They shorten when the larynx drops to the typical posture for singing. It tilts a little tiny bit because of the uneven muscle lengths. It doesn't seem as if it should matter maybe a sixteenth of an inch. What do you think would happen if you put a sixteenth inch lift into one shoe of a marathon runner? Hip pain, knee pain, done by the sixteenth mile. Those kinds of structural asymmetries cause clinical problems, especially in high performance voice users. And they are manageable. Again, for the laryngologists in the room, a little clinical pearl. We've all gotten phone calls from our general surgeon colleagues who say, I did a thyroid, I know it's perfect. I didn't get the superior laryngeal nerve. Everything's intact, but there's a voice problem. Will you see the patient? And we sit there and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't know a superior laryngeal nerve paralysis if it were labeled. <clears throat> and we see the patient, the nerves are perfect. If the skin of the neck under the incision adheres to the trachea or the larynx, when the larynx moves in position to sing, it creates a little bit of resistance that is extremely disturbing to the voice user. And you can spot this in a heartbeat. You just look at the neck and ask the patient to swallow. And if the skin puckers up as the larynx rises, that's the problem. And usually it goes away and takes care of itself. It takes a few months. Uh, occasionally you actually have to operate on it, separate the adhesions, swing a little muscle in between. But it's another on the list of fairly common problems that are not recognized as commonly as they should be. The true vocal folds, false vocal folds, ventricle of Morgani and mucosa make up what we care about on the inside of the larynx. Again, on the left is anterior, posterior, true vocal folds, false vocal folds, and a little pocket in between called the ventricle of Morgani. That's, again, sliced, that's front, back. This is cut this way, so you're looking straight on. Here's the trachea, the airway, the true vocal folds, the false vocal folds, the ventricle, the vocalis muscle that we discussed. Please notice several very important features. Number one, the true vocal folds have a broad area of contact in millimeters. 
we're used to looking at pictures and we think of them as three dimension as two dimensional but they are three dimensional they're not like two pieces of paper they're more like two fingers second please notice the convergence the steeple shape of the airway as it moves toward the vocal folds that is critical to the aerodynamic function of the voice system if we lose that or if we alter it, for example, by having a thyroid, or a thyroplasty implant that is too low and excessively squares this area, then we look at the vocal folds from above and think that we had a great result, but we have a patient who is unhappy because the voice requires effort and is inefficient and doesn't sound right. There is important aerodynamic science that goes on here. We have the airstream that passes through an area of resistance. It makes little swirls called vortices. The false focal folds function as a downstream resistor, which is critical in vortex formation. So we can't just go in and cuff them off because we don't see the vocal folds too well. And in the early years when I was training before we knew that stuff, that was not an uncommon maneuver. Science says, us better. The vocal folds have a muscular membranous portion and a cartilaginous portion. When we're born, it's about 50-50. In adults, it's about two-thirds muscular membranous, or sorry, three, in adulthood, it's about three-fifths muscular membranous and two-fifths cartilaginous. This is a human larynx picture, front, back, right, left. We used to be taught that the muscular membranous portion was phonatory for making sound, and the cartilaginous portion was respiratory. Any of the laryngologists in the room and any of the speech pathologists who've looked at strobes have probably encountered patients who have large webs, sometimes involving the entire muscular membranous vocal folds, but sometimes have pretty clear voices, often high pitch. And when you look at them with the stroboscope, they are forming a mucosal wave with the mucosa in the cartilaginous portion. Pretty good mucosal wave. So we know that under pathologic circumstances, the cartilaginous portion can play a role in phonation. We do not know whether it does in elite phonation or normal phonation, but until we do know, my advice always has been to treat the entire vocal fold, including the cartilaginous portion, with great care. Because of that dichotomy that we were taught, it's been fairly common for surgeons to just go in with a laser and cook everything back here, for example, if there's a granuloma, and not worry about it because it's the respiratory portion. People sometimes end up with voice problems. This area requires more research and should be treated with great respect in the operating room until that research is done. The mucosa, has a wet, lubricated contact surface. And that lubrication is created by a combination of serous and mucinous glands. The serous glands create thin, watery lubricant. The mucinous glands create thick lubricant. They mix to create optimal viscosity. Many of the things that we think of as drying the vocal folds, like antihistamines, actually shift from a serous to mucinous predominance. It's like thickening the oil in your car engine. It doesn't work efficiently. The vocal folds can't pull apart well after they come together. Surface damage is increased. Now, most of the covering in the respiratory system is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, which means it has little hairs on it, like to move the mucus blanket around in your nose and elsewhere. Your vocal folds, if you're male, make contact about 100 times a second, if you're female, twice that. As they smash together, if it had those delicate little hairs, they wouldn't last very long. So the body was designed differently. That one area of the respiratory system is stratified squamous epithelium, sufficient to withstand that kind of trauma. The epithelium is layered. When I was in residency in the 70s, 
we thought the focal fold epithelium was the same as the epithelium on the inside of our cheek, but it isn't. Minoru Hirano described this in Japanese in 75, in English for the first time in 77. This is one of his slides. This is a vocal fold. The other vocal fold would be over here under the Drexel letterhead. The space in between is called the glottis. I like to fantasize that this was the one time when there was an anatomist who had a sense of humor. As you know, the glottis is the reference point in this system. Everything is either glottic at the vocal fold level, superglottic above, or subglottic. There is no glottis. It's a space. When you're phonating and your vocal folds are together, it's non-existent. It's not a structure, and yet it is our reference point. <clears throat> so this is not like the tissue on the inside of your mouth. There's an epithelium, superficial, intermediate, and deep layers of lamina propria, and muscle, the vocalis muscle. The epithelium and the superficial layer of lamina propria, also known as Reinke space, glide over the surface and make the mucosal wave. The muscle forms resistance, and the intermediate and deep layers of lamina propria together are called the vocal ligament, and they create a transition zone. They are the structure that was mislabeled vocal cord. So that white thing on the early slide is here, and the vocal fold is built around it. This is very complex architecture, and if it is destroyed by hemorrhage, trauma, surgery, and the epithelium becomes stuck to the vocal ligament, which is not nearly so pliable, and creates scar, we can do some things to ameliorate the problem, but we cannot restore normalcy yet. That will require genetic regenerative medicine that, that we're not quite at. Although we're getting closer, thanks to Shigeru Hirano, many of us are using growth factors in SCAR and getting some good results, but not anywhere near normalcy. So, how many of you lie awake at night wondering how the epithelium is attached to the superficial layer of lamina propria? Well, <laughs> some of us do. <clears throat> There is a basement membrane. For the residents in the room, the basement membrane was discovered by Steve Gray as his resident research project. So think about that while you're evaluating your own research. <laughs> it turns out that there are type 3 collagen loops that emanate from and reinsert into the basement membrane through which pass type 3 collagen fibers that keep the epithelium from flying off, which it does in diseases such as Dermolysis bullosa et dystrophia. It can fly off. The materials responsible for healing in the vocal folds are in this general area. This architecture and those materials are not only complex, but they also are genetically controlled. So how many speech-language pathologists in the room? Think about this. One of my favorite Philadelphia facts is that we have 500,000 Italians in Philadelphia. Okay? You have a kid who comes into your office with nodules. The kid screams, the aunt screams, the mother screams, everybody screams. <laughs> Say, of course the kid has nodules. You go into South Philly in the summertime and the windows are open and stand in the middle of the street and you can hear the dinner conversations for six blocks in all directions. <laughs> How come only one kid got nodules? It's not that simple. And the answer probably lies in this region. I, I'm, I'm moving on because I could talk about this for a long time. It has, you know, we all have routine vocal fold trauma. Most of us heal. We don't heal as well if we pour acid from reflux over the trauma. But how we heal and whether we can sustain a voice career probably has a lot to do with that area. So the vocal folds make a sound. The sound passes through the resonator system. To make a sound requires some power. And that power comes from below the vocal folds or the infraglottic vocal tract. 
So how does this voice work? We have an oscillator, that's the vocal folds, a power source that sets the oscillator into oscillation, and a resonator which shapes the sound. First, we need to think. Even tenors, we need to think. Hey! <laughs> That was a nice ring in that hand. No question about that voice classification. <laughs> so we get an idea. We prepare to speak. We pre-tune muscles and systems all over the body, utter a sound, and within milliseconds, adjust that sound to target usually by auditory feedback, but if we're trained singers and we're in a choir and we can't hear anything, we can do it by tactile feedback, singing by feel rather than by ear. An immensely complicated process that maybe you'll hear a little more about later. There are lots of things I would love to cover with you. Neurolaryngology is our newest field. There are there are components of this system that provide information about everything from spasmodic dysphonia to dysphonia and dysarthria associated with stroke, depending upon whether that stroke is above or below the periaqueductal gray matter, among other things. It's truly fascinating if you want something to look into. Respiration is a combination of active and passive forces. Those of you who are still wide awake, and I'm surprised that it's most of you, are breathing in actively and then you are relaxing. And the natural recoil lets your air out. I, however, am up here pontificating, so I'm using active expiration to support the sound. The diaphragm muscle and the external intercostals are the primary muscles of inspiration. You lower your diaphragm. It creates a larger space, so you created a vacuum, and it sucks in air. You should know that that's true, but that's not the whole truth. There was an elegant paper out of Stockholm, Lee Anderson, Von Euler, and Sundberg, that showed that the diaphragm is co-activated during elite singing, at least in women. So it may be part of the pressure control valve system so that subglottic pressure doesn't overdrive. So once again, what I told you is true, but not the whole story. Expiration is caused by abdominal and back muscles and internal intercostals. So what's support really? Uh, we could easily argue about that forever, but we won't. Here's the short story. If you have a balloon and you want to get air out of the balloon, what do you do? You squeeze the balloon. Physics. When you have a container of a given size and you decrease the size, the pressure in the gas goes up. And if you really want it to come out the top of the balloon, maybe you cheat a little bit on the bottom of your hands and create an upward vector of force when you push the balloon together. Furthermore, if you want to do that in a controlled fashion, do you want a really full balloon or a half-empty, squishy balloon? On a full balloon. Those are the physical facts behind the way support should be taught in the studio. What imagery one uses to achieve efficient control over that is another issue. But getting a steady subglottic power source is essential to efficient and healthy phonation. Let's take the vocal folds arbitrarily together and figure out what that subglottic pressure does. We adduct, bring together the vocal folds with an elective amount of force. We decide how to do that. When the subglottic pressure exceeds the adductory force, the vocal folds are blown apart. From the bottom up and from the back forward, it's called a vertical phase difference. The contact edge of the vocal folds is not only three-dimensional, it moves differently, bottom to top, during phonation, opening and closing.
that action creates a sound. It's a lot like the sound of a trumpet mouthpiece without the trumpet attached. It's the oscillator. If you take a trumpet mouthpiece and put it on a trumpet and then a French horn, it'll sound like a trumpet and then mostly like a French horn. Dennis' brain would know the difference, but you would not mistake the French horn for a trumpet. So your vocal fold voice source signal passes through your infinitely variable interconnected system of resonators. When you create it at the vocal folds, it drops off at about 12 dB an octave, a fairly boring acoustical signal. When it comes out of your mouth, it looks like a nice Pocono mountain range. Those peaks are called formants, and they are responsible for your distinctive vocal signature. They also are responsible for vowel intelligibility, unfortunately, because especially in sopranos, that creates some articulation and understanding challenges. And they are also are responsible for audibility. Johann Sundberg described the singer's format, which we in the music world think about as ring. Um, and ring is important. If any of you ever spoke with or heard Pavarotti up close, he didn't have a particularly loud voice. But you could put him in front of 120 professional singers in an orchestra, and you could still hear him out in the lobby. That was ring not loudness. That's also what allows us to go to an Eagles game and scream and not get hoarse afterwards or a bar. The singer's format is more or less around 3,000 hertz, but it turns out that it varies in center frequency depending on voice classification. So if you take a synthesizer and have everything constant and just change the form center frequency of the singer's format, you'll hear the voice go from soprano to bass. There's a lot more that we need to know about this as well. So how do we control all of this stuff? Let's take the two most common things, fundamental frequency and intensity. So fundamental frequency corresponds with pitch. They're not the same thing, but they're linked. So how do you do that? Well, you take your superior laryngeal nerve and fire your cricothyroid muscles and stretch the vocal folds. So the subglottic pressure is exposed to a larger area because the vocal folds are stretched. So it exerts forces that allow the vocal folds to open more quickly. They're stretched. The Bernoulli principle, the airflow is greater, and the elastic behavior is a little different, not the elasticity, but the behavior. So they close faster, they open and close more times in a second. Your frequency is gone. How about intensity? Suppose you go to a wonderful lecture, and at the end of the lecture, you want to applaud vigorously. Do you do this? No. You bring your hands far apart and snap them together. Similarly, if you want to sing more loudly, you increase your adductory force, you increase your subglottic pressure. When you blow your vocal folds apart, you blow them further apart. That is, you've increased the amplitude of displacement from the midline. And they snap together and shut off that.